We're very fortunate to have um, as our uh, final, final session, I mentioned the three eyes, three very seasoned Silicon Valley executives. Each of them have, I'll call, broken a lot of glass and broken a lot of glass ceilings. I'll start from my, um, from my right uh, with Jeff Yang, who is our conference co-chair, but also a uh, founder and managing director of Redpoint Ventures, a highly, highly successful uh, technology venture capitalist firm. Next to him is Ken Shea, also a C100 member. He is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Fortinet, a publicly traded uh, technology company. And also next to him is uh, Gideon Yu, who is the co-owner of the San Francisco 49ers. Not a lot of Asians in uh, professional sports. He uh, was the first uh, president of color in NFL history, and also he was the CFO of YouTube and Facebook. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's, our, it's my honor to be here to, to moderate these, these, uh, these incredible speakers. And um, if it's all right with you all, I'm going to be a little bit player coach. And the three of us are, are just going to have a conversation and then uh, leave it open to you. And, and the topic is, is, is quite interesting. Um, and as we were talking, it occurred to us that you know, we have a very, uh, in some ways, a very diverse panel. Uh, in, some, in some ways, we really represent what Silicon Valley is. Uh, you know, we have Ken, who is a, a, a uh, first generation um, uh, immigrant who's, who's been incredibly successful, uh, you know, starting two uh, public companies uh, that, that are highly valuable and highly respected. Uh, we have Gideon, who came here, uh, I'll call him uh, Generation 1.2. You know, he came when he was two years old, and, and he's been involved with some of, the most, uh, some of the most interesting companies in Silicon Valley. He's got an incredible nose for uh, startup companies and opportunities generally. Um, he, he spent time at Disney, spent time at uh, Yahoo, he spent time at uh, YouTube, spent time at Facebook, a couple of mildly recognizable names, and now uh, he just finished a stint um, as co-owner and president of the San Francisco 49ers, uh, but he also spent a little bit of time in the venture business uh, at two very highly respected firms. And then you have me, and you know, I'm a second generation. Um, my parents were born in uh, Shanghai, and I've grown up here you know, my whole life, and so I think we have somewhat different perspectives given where we, where we are, and I thought, I thought the way we'd start was just to start by asking uh, each of you uh, to talk a little bit about your, your upbringing and kind of how you got to where you are, uh, um, to put a little bit of color on the bios that are, that are in the packet. And maybe we start with, uh, with Ken, given that you're, you're first generation. Okay. Um, I kind of uh, uh, come from engineer technology background. So that's where I believe most Asian Americans come here. That's where I try to get their advanced study uh, in the technology field. Uh, so my area actually is the internet and uh, internet security is kind of pretty sensitive area right now. Uh, but 20 some years ago, it's still pretty new and uh, uh, very interesting area. So that's where I kind of uh, started when I studied at Stanford University. It's kind of a, uh, first as a kind of a hobby or help friend, try to set up internet connection and try to help them set up all the all the firewall, all the things, and uh, pretty much in exchange for a nice dinner, all these kind of things. And then once I get like a 20, 30, 40 customer, I say, hey, maybe I can charge a little bit money. And then I guess starting to get some monthly income, and then eventually kind of uh, uh, not quite finish my study and then start a company. Uh, so that's the way, and, uh, but I have to say, during the process, because the first generation, uh, we have kind of a, both on the language, on the culture, a lot of things. We probably work it on the technology, but actually on the other side, sales, marketing, how to deal with all. How old were you when you came? Uh, 27. So I basically already got my, my master, <coughs> uh, bachelor master in Tsinghua before I come here uh, to study. So it's kind of a pretty late, I have to say. And, uh, <clears throat> but then uh, the good part really, we really know the technology quite well at that time. Uh, the challenging part is really how to like, uh, get other things going, in, in, like, a, like a, so that's a lot of learning curve, as it take me about three companies. So the first company, not quite successful, 
I kind of learn the process, but also how to deal with customer and how to deal with uh, investor, all the things. And then the second company has uh, with help with all the <coughs> friends, the classmates, VC is relatively successful. The second company sold for four billion dollar. And then the third company, yeah, third company actually a uh, lot more investor help. Basically, we have uh, over one hundred investor and uh, and uh, and also including the leading investor, uh, Jeff, his firm, all these things. And then at the same time, also kind of get better uh, on, on how to deal with uh, like a sales marketing operation. So it's kind of a learning curve. So that's one thing I feel is quite important for this first generation. You really need to keep learning and uh, because there are a lot of things actually for us to keep learning and it's very, very important. On the other side also, don't lose your advantage, which is really the technology, and also you can make all this much better. So there's a lot of work at engineer and uh, try to, and also when we try to grow the business, also try to see what, what's your, uh, which area you can probably better than some US company. So that's what for us, when we try to build a, the company, so we, we, the first thing we want to sell the product, we really go global. Kind of very interesting, in the first few years, actually APEC is our biggest market, and then the next few years, Europe is the biggest market. Right now it's a, like a American, US is starting to become the biggest market. So that's where we feel we know the international, know the whole global relatively better. So that's where we kind of uh, try to play our advantage uh, to the guys things going. So that's in the last, I think, 24, 25 years. Gideon, uh, I mean, just to take us through a little bit when, when you got here and, and what it was like growing up uh, in Tennessee and, and what brought you out here. Well, uh, first and foremost, I, um, uh, thanks for inviting me for, to this panel, Jeff. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you and Ken. Uh, almost don't even feel uh, like I should be on the stage with you, Ken. It's an uh, incredible background. Um, so, so my background and how I got here was um, uh, completely... Uh, atypical, I think, of, of, of normal experience. I came here, by the way, I'm Korean. I'm, I'm the uh, Korean part of the U's, and there's the uh, Chinese part of the U's. <laughs> um, uh, we immigrated here, my mom and I, uh, when I was uh, one year old. Um, my father had already come a year before that to go and attend uh, seminary uh, to become a minister at uh, Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. And for anybody here who understands Nashville, Tennessee, I'm in my mid-40s, so so this was in the 70s uh, in, in Nashville, uh, was not, certainly was not a bastion of uh, diversity um, or, or tolerance even. Um, you know, I think compounded, co compounding the fact that my skin color was different uh, was the fact that my mom and my, my dad, as well as myself, uh, we couldn't speak English. Um, and uh, you know, I was really the only Asian around. So, you know, there, you know, the three of us had talked before this. There, there, was a, there was a lot of rough stories about growing up, uh, you know, a, as an immigrant, uh, really as a first generation almost. It felt like, you know, coming over uh, in the deep south of the 70s and 80s. Um, you, know, I, you know, believe it or not, I had a, I, I, I had a run in with the, the, the Ku Klux Klan back then uh, at one point. You didn't think that they even existed, but they actually do. Um, you know, you know that to. You know, my my identity was was uh, you know I was called a chink by you know every single person I I, I met regardless of what my name was, um, uh, but look I'll, I'll tell you that. There are different reactions to, a situation like that that people will have. You know we talked about this a little bit beforehand. You know on the one extreme. Um, you can let that paralyze you, and it becomes uh, really debilitating. It makes you very angry. Uh, on the other hand, though, for me, um, and I get some criticism for this. You know, I, some people um, on the other side, you know, call me an assimilator or whatever else like that. But what I try to do was uh, say, look, the the best thing I could do in that situation was uh, just to ignore that the problem even existed, and uh, do the best I could, not only uh, to fit in. That's a double negative. Not, not, not only do not bad, but, uh, but actually thrive. Actually, actually be in a culture where you know, I'm really the only Asian. I mean, in my elementary school, there was 300 kids, and uh, the second Asian person other than me to come into that elementary school was my little brother. Um, so uh, you know, the question is, at that point, uh, you know, what do I have to do mentally as well as uh, uh, emotionally as well as relationship-wise 
uh, to actually take that and use it to my advantage. And uh, I'll tell you, I think that's, that's really the story, of, uh, the, the story of my life and how I got here. And, and, and so for me, uh, I really represent kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. I was, uh, I was born in New York. Uh, you know, I first spoke, we, we spoke Chinese at home, so I spoke Chinese before I spoke English. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we, we were raised, I was raised, I was raised in a pretty uh, Chinese family, but, uh, you know, I grew up going to school in the States and, and, and uh, you know, I'm very, uh, I'm very American. Um, but I, I would say, you know, for a long time, I, I, was, I was struggling to kind of relate to, to both cultures uh, because we'd always have these family gatherings and, you know, I went to Chinese school on, on Saturday mornings, which I hated. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I definitely felt as if, you know, I really wanted to, to fit in and I wanted to fit in, you know, every place I was. Um, and it, I, I kind of remember it creating a, a little bit of uh, a paradox, you know, in me about, you know, wanting to fit in in one place and also wanting to fit in, you know, in the other place. And not I, I wouldn't say I was, uh, uh, I had a firm sense of identity of kind of who I was. I was more trying to fit in everywhere, uh, everywhere I was going to be. And I don't think it was until later, later in life did I kind of embrace, you know, my diversity. I, I think the first part of my life I was trying to ignore you know, my diversity. Uh, and, and, you know, living in New York, I don't think I felt the same types, uh, I didn't have the same uh, difficulties in, in uh, assimilating like Ken did, or I didn't have the same uh, uh, being, you know, living in New York, you're, you're no way, you're, you're the only Asians, you know, kind of in the area. But, you know, in my own way, I, I felt that, um, um, there were a bunch of preconceived notions, and, and through your life, you feel a lot of. Uh, you, there are times when you feel a lot of discriminations, but I feel as if it more kind of shaped who I am, and and I almost feel as if it motivated me and draw, uh, drove me more than it did hinder me. And, and we talked a little bit about this uh, at, uh, uh, last week, but I think there are people who either become angry, uh, become paralyzed, or uses them to motivate, and and I think. I, I would hope that that most, if not all of us, would, would be in the latter, latter category and, and that it helps you identify who you are and gives you something to prove. And then, so that kind of leads me to, you know, a question I'll ask you guys, which is, you know, how did you uh, cope with your own diversity and how did it affect your identity in terms of how it, motivate, how it motivates you? Well, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, yeah, I remember when, um, when, and this is a very emotional topic for me because, um, be, being the only, uh, be, being the only, uh, Asian person in an entire community, uh, what was very tough. I think, uh, I think, like I said earlier, I think for me, the, the most important thing that, that I did to cope with this was, uh, to be okay with being the only Asian in the room. And uh, th that, that takes a lot of, of effort to get to the point where you're okay doing that. And what's funny is that, that uh, you know, a story, when I, when, I, when I left Nashville for the first time uh, to go to school out here at Stanford, um, I remember I was about to go into my first meeting of the uh, Korean American Student Association. And I was so excited, I'm like, there's going to be that many people. Usually, I'm, you know, the only other Koreans my age or Asians my age were, you know, related to me. So going into this room, I'm like, this is going to be the coolest thing ever. But then when I go in there, um, you know, I realized that uh, I, I really didn't, when, when trying to fit in, I really didn't have much of an identity actually left. Like, like you said, Jeff, I, I go into this room and, and I didn't fit in. I actually almost felt a little bit weird being in a room um, <laughs> kind of like this, right? <laughs> you guys are making me nervous. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 it was weird because, you know, I remember some of my, uh, my white friends said, hey, you should go hang out with your, with, with, uh, you know, with, with your guys over there, you know, with people that are like you. And they didn't mean it in a, um, in, in a racist kind of way. It was just a, hey, um, you get an opportunity to hang out with other Koreans, and that's, and that's pretty cool. So, so what I found, Jeff, was that, um, 
to the to the Koreans, I was I was what they called a Twinkie, um, <laughs> yellow on the outside, white on the inside, um, and uh, to my white friends, I was Asian, and uh, there there was not. Uh, there was nothing kind of in the middle that I kind of had uh, as far as fitting into anybody. So that was kind of the way I coped with it when I found was suddenly I was, it, my, my, my actual ethnicity was shoved into my face when I actually came to a place where there was more diversity. Right. And, and did it make you feel uh, like you were carrying a mantle of any kind for others? Uh, and that's a good question. I thought about that uh, before this meeting. I, I think that carrying the mantle uh, and being a good example for others has, has only come now, uh, right. later on in my life. I think at the time, I felt like I had enough problems of my own right. <laughs> to, to worry about being an example for other people. Certainly was not high on my list. I, um, yeah, so I, I didn't think that was the case. I, I, I do feel that now. Though. Ken, t talk a little bit about how you cope with your own diversity and how it shaped kind of who you are and what, what motivated you. Um, I, I was trained uh, when I was very, very young age, uh, kind of play professional uh, volleyball, actually kind of go to the, get to the Olympic level because my, my height. Uh, so that's where, like, uh, I feel that's kind of quite important, just like you play any sports. It, you cannot always trade fairly. So maybe the, <clears throat> the, the other player, or maybe the judge, whatever. So that, that's where kind of, uh, I feel also kind of important for each American, also for a lot of kids. You know, get in this kind of sports, young age, so they, they can learn to deal with it. How to deal with all this uh, <clears throat> unfair situation? How to deal with win lose? All these kind of things. And uh, eventually, the same thing when you go to the business, also the same thing. Sometimes, like just like volleyball is really the team sports. You really need to get a team together. So you really need to get all the people like kind of <clears throat> understand, have the trust, and eventually. So that that's I think I have to say. In a lot of business environment, it's a lot of things actually not not quite a, <clears throat> quite a fair, and that's you have to put extra effort and have extra margin to win it. Uh, otherwise, it will be very very difficult. Uh, I totally agree with the, <clears throat> with the discussion we have. Really, uh, sometimes when you're facing a fair situation, that's probably only can motivate you to do better. So that's the way you really want to fight, you want to be the winner. So that's where kind of quite important, instead of a, whether you kind of get angry or give up about this kind of things, that's what never get you into the, 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 the better situation. So that's where kind of we feel very, very important and for us how to learn to deal with it, keep it very, very open, and at the same time, and try to see what's the advantage you have, and also have extra, extra margin to win the whole things. Uh, like this morning, just a, with my son play some tennis tournament and that's the way I, I coach him but hey, if you really want to win a game, sometimes maybe not now that the other side maybe you go in the they, they call out all this kind of don't doesn't matter. You just deal with it. Make sure you have extra margin so you can you can win it win the game. So that's I feel is kind of the same thing to the life, to the business situation. Actually it was uh, I thought it was really interesting. Yesterday uh, for those of you who were in that the uh, the session with Vivek Ranadive, uh, he was I thought he had some interesting perspectives about uh, uh, toughness and and having things come easy. And he was he he was expressing the point of view that he worries a little bit about this generation where you know everything's okay and and uh, uh, you don't have to really fight for things and and everybody's a winner uh, versus having things be tough and and kind of overcoming adversity and and how it drives you. And I thought. Uh, he was more eloquent than I at saying it, but I thought that was a really interesting point about uh, you know how it shapes you and how it, how it drives and motivates you. Um, I, I was go ahead. I, I, I'll even say that, uh, that that my wife, who's probably watching at home, um, she uh, she grew up very different from my. She, she immigrated also from uh, from Korea when she was uh, one year old as well, um, but they moved out to uh, Los Angeles, uh, where. Um, you know, you, you, where she grew up, you could conceivably not speak English and still do just fine, and speak only Korean, live, hang out with only Koreans, eat only Korean, and read and speak only Korean, right? So, um, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, uh, you know, an interesting story is when, when after we first got married, um, I brought her back to Nashville with me, and we went to go eat at this place called the Cracker Barrel, which is, uh, if, if you guys know what that is. <laughs> Some of you guys know who that is, obviously. Uh, and yeah, it was awesome. And uh, so, so we, we're, we're in there, and um, 
you know, she looks at me and she says, why is everybody looking at us? <laughs> and I looked up and I looked around and I realized that, uh, yeah, they were, everybody was looking at us, but that's just kind of the way it is. That's just kind of uh, the, the, the way in which uh, I grew up. It's different from the way in which she grew up, but what ends up happening is I think that, that if that's not put in your face from an early age, or if you don't have to deal with that from an early age, what ends up happening is that you're not equipped or not ready uh, to get out into what I would call the real world, where, where race, if not racism, race awareness is certainly gonna be a reality of your life. Um, and you know, I, being shielded from that, I think, is actually a disservice. So, uh, an interesting thing I was thinking about was, you know, we can talk about how it influenced you know, your identity, your cultural identity and your race influenced the path you took. But, but I, I'm just curious, uh, how did it influence the path you didn't take? Uh, in other words, um, to what extent did, did you say, you know, that probably isn't really going to be an option, but this one really is? I mean, was it, w were they conscious decisions? Um, Ken, do you, do you want to talk a little? Um, I think yeah, there's some situation that's where um, sometimes probably it's more difficult to, to fight about the sense, right? So that's where, uh, but then uh, for me, I just keep it quite open to, uh, to, to, to all. everybody here is really uh, just lay out what's the, what's the, uh, what's our option and what's, what we can do here. Right, so there, there are certain things, there's certain limit. Uh, but on the other side, uh, just try to make sure everybody understand uh, the situation and the, all the option. Uh, that's kind of a, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's a very early, I, I usually, there's kind of like a, uh, there's some sense more like related decision analysis, all these kind of things. Uh, that's where somehow just, just take some step back and think about what's, what's the things you can do and then what's the chance. And, uh, but I think that we are not quite afraid to take some risk, but on the other side, what's the cost, what's all these kind of things also kind of related. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question. Well, I, I guess what I, what I was referring to was, you know, I, at least as I, as I looked at my own, my, my own experiences, I thought, you know, anything is possible, um, but there is also kind of within limits. Right. And, and I kind of came to the conclusion, boy, you know, because of, um, you know, I, I found some doubt in my mind about, you know, if you go to big, you know, big corporate America, uh, where uh, it, it's sometimes beyond just, uh, you know, a true meritocracy, but, but all the, you know, the cultural and, and if there are discrimination issues, to, to the extent that could you labor your whole life and, and, and be hit by, you know, uh, some kind of ceiling. And, and at least for me, I don't know if it was conscious or unconscious, you know, part of what really attracted me to smaller companies um, uh, that, were, that were true meritocracies where individual success could ultimately be translated into, into uh, organizational success and where, you know, if you grow up in an organization and you're successful, you can begin to chart your own course and grow with the organization. I found that, that more appealing and I was just curious you know, in, in terms of the path. And I think part of that is the allure and the magic of Silicon Valley, and that people, people can come all over from, you know, uh, from all walks of life, and if they're really good at something, they can pull a group of people who are good at something, and there really aren't any, there are, you know, it's not a complete meritocracy, but it's, it's largely a meritocracy in that, in that uh, uh, there are people who will invest in you, there are companies that will, uh, give you uh, resources and, and extend all sorts and give you every opportunity to succeed if you've got a great idea and you've got the smarts and the drive to execute it. And so the other side is, you know, did, it, did, it, did all those people come have a path that they didn't choose to take versus one they chose to take? And, and like, the, uh, like the article you, you fought us two days ago, Right, that, that, that's about is a, as a, when you play whether the basketball player or whatever the company. Uh, Sometimes try to see what's your uh, the true core asset advantage you, you can play, and what's the other. Sometimes when you can be much stronger, bigger, but then how you can play, uh, make sure play your own game, not their game, 
Yeah, this is an article uh, that actually Angie forwarded to me uh, about David versus Goliath and how when you're competing against Goliaths, you can't really compete on, uh, on their advantages. You have to use their disadvantages to your advantages and kind of change the nature of the game. And, and to that extent, I asked, I asked um, Ken and Gideon to think about how you, you could turn some of the advantages or perceptions you know, about, uh, about, about you and your culture, how could you turn those into advantages? Um, you know, I don't know if Gideon, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, as far as uh, perceptions about our culture, you know, I'm good at math. I'm, uh, my mom made me play piano every day. <laughs> I can't do a layup in basketball that looks normal. Um, uh, look, I, I think that the perception uh, or, or uh, you know, what's unique about the culture that, that, uh, that my family embraced uh, that I think was a tremendous advantage for me was uh, my parents' absolute focus on education. As, and, and, and it was above all else. There was no question. I mean, that, it was... Uh, Okay, I got a, I got a hun straight hundreds on my report card. Well, was that was was that your best effort? Um, uh, and then and then a focus uh, whether whether right or wrong on on achievement, um, and that that can have many bad manifestations. Um, but you know I think uh, you know the, the story that I will always tell about my father that uh, you know that for, to this day he's my hero for this. Um, you know we grew up uh, because my father was a minister. We grew up very poor. And um, you know, we, when I had gotten my uh, my letter of acceptance to Stanford, uh, we were super excited. However, uh, we we could not afford to go to Stanford. We we had to await the um, uh, the financial aid decision. Um, you know, otherwise, I'm going to a school that uh, you know that, that, that certainly wasn't going to be at the level of Stanford. And um, when we got our financial aid decision back. Uh, it was it was good. It was it had you know some grants, some loans, and these kind of things. And I was really excited. I said, "Dad, where's my uh, where's my letter? Let me sign it and, and, and send it back in." And he's like, "Oh, I sent it back in like three weeks ago." And I forged your name. And I said, "Well, wh why did you do that?" And he said, "Well, uh, yes, a minister forging my name. That's if you want to know, that's what uh, And what he said was, and, and this is going to be something that that should hit the home should, should hit home for many people in this audience. He said. We came to America so that my son could go to Stanford. And if I have to, I'm going to start crying when I say this. Uh, it, 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 if, if I have to uh, beg, borrow, and, and steal uh, to let you go there, that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just that story. It was the way in which uh, I was raised. It was the way in which they instilled values in me. That, look, I, um, I think that's, that's a tremendous advantage. And, and I wouldn't trade. Uh, I wouldn't trade being raised like that for anything. Well, that's actually a great transition to uh, a question that we can use the uh, the system on, which is, um, which of the following do you think does the audience think has the biggest impact on an individual's capacity for innovation and entrepreneurship? Education, cultural upbringing, social work environment, or character? And then, and then I thought maybe we could talk about that for a minute. So go ahead and vote, please. So I'm going to ask, those little uh, when that, this, when that, this comes uh, up, I'm going to say, I'm going to ask you, home, what you, what you all think is uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, biggest, uh, uh, the biggest impact on an individual's capacity for innovation and entrepreneurship. And then I'm going to ask you to bear in mind, okay, so we got character one, wow, cultural upbringing two, and I suspect those are kind of related maybe. Uh, social and work environment, and education being the last. That's really interesting. Okay, you guys will have to stay after school, and um, in order to, <laughs> Drop we're going to need, need a little bit of tutoring <laughs> session here. Okay, so what do you, what do you, what do you think of that? And then, and, and if you don't mind, make a distinction for me between uh, entrepreneurs versus managers. Oh. Okay. Uh, Kind of two things, innovation and entrepreneurship, I feel is two different, uh, which I, I, from my opinion, the innovation probably more depend on the environment and other things. And then the, the entrepreneurship probably is all, uh, I, don't see, I don't quite see the model. I think it's a probably, I think education also kind of uh, important, right? You need to keep in, 
Entrepreneurship, really, you need to keep in learning. Right. Uh, so, so that's the part I, I feel uh, maybe I have a little bit different answer. Yeah. And then what about management? Uh, management, definitely you need to keep in learning. And uh, since really in the business world, there's always since, uh, and also how to deal with all the environment is also kind of important. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's all the learning process all these years. And uh, uh, I, guess, uh, I kind of quite see some of it, yeah. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think for entrepreneurship, um, I think cultural upbringing is a gate, uh, uh, meaning I, I think the way you were raised, uh, for example, the way I was raised was very risk averse, was very traditionally Asian. And uh, that, that caused me to, to not have any desire to go into um, uh, entrepreneurship. So, so I, I think your cultural upbringing, the way in which your parents raised you, the way in which uh, values were instilled in you, will cause you to go one direction or another. That doesn't necessarily mean success, though, which is why I call it a gate. I, I, I think then it's, it's social and work environment um, that once you've gotten past that initial gate and you're going towards entrepreneurship, that I think makes the biggest difference. As far as um, uh, uh, management, um, uh, for me, I would, go, uh, I would go character. Good, why? Uh, there obviously has to be some, some presumptions made in the, uh, uh, in, in the answer there. I'm going to presume for a second that, uh, uh, that all else is roughly equal, yep. that, that, that you have uh, a decent enough education, that you're a hard enough worker. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I find it weird to talk about entrepreneurship when we have Ken here, but I think as far as management, I can talk. And, um, what separates the really great ones from the not so great ones. Uh, even though you can have short term success, the long term success is, um, in my opinion, the ones that have great character, great integrity, uh, are the ones that will um, uh, do the right thing when nobody's watching, are the ones that uh, you know are going to be a great team member. And I think that that's what gets the character. Uh, I, don't, I actually don't care if uh, you're you got a little bit higher score on your SAT, or maybe you, you, know, you have a couple more qualifications. It really comes down to me, uh, you know, is this the kind of person that I truly uh, think is, uh, you know, has the highest level of integrity and character? So that, that's why I would say management uh, has that. Hmm. You see, I, I would have thought for entrepreneurship and innovation, it's largely, largely education, you know, where, where you have to know enough about what the issues of the problem are to kind of understand how you're going to solve it. And if you don't, have the basics of, of knowledge of there's a problem here, uh, but I know how to solve it, that you can't get there. I, I would have said cultural upbringing on the management side because I think, I think it, it, it's a little bit of, um, I think in many Asian cultures, uh, the concept of uh, deference, uh, especially to your elders, uh, would prohibit you from taking the initiative to, you know, something can be done better or taking ownership of something when you think that, that you're not supposed to uh, undermine or, or uh, break faith uh, of those who are more senior to you. And, then, and, then, and that notion of, well, if no one's going to solve it, I should solve it. And I've always found that it's, it's remarkable that if someone steps up to lead, there are people who want to follow. They're just not everybody want, not everybody wants to lead, and that not, not all solutions are as clear to everybody as they are to someone who wants to lead, sees a clear path. And so that, that, that's why I, I would have uh, given those answers. Okay, can we debate? Sure, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're going to lose, but. <laughs> can we arm wrestle then? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the question that I would have, though, and, and to advocate for myself for a second, would be, um, how many people in this in this room um, are are sufficiently smart in a topic that have thought about a business idea that they would like to start, but for whatever cultural reason um, have decided that they don't want to do it or can't do it or whatever? And my guess is that if you're honest with yourself, there's a lot of you. And if I were to say, okay, how many people actually have an idea right now that they thought about when I say that? There's I don't know, a third or half of the people in this room. All three of us have an idea, I'm sure, as, as well. The question then becomes, what's stopping you from doing that? And, and I don't know if it's education. I wonder if it's, 
something else that's stopping you from doing that? I think probably, at least in the Chinese American community, people quite uh, brave to have a lot of a great idea and also want to start a company. But how to grow from like a, when you want to start a company or small, go to bigger, all these kind of things. That, that's I, I'm on Jeff's side, it's really the education. You need to constantly train yourself. And uh, I think we are kind of more trained is that sometimes we more call book smart is that people really can, can uh, market in the, in, the, in the school, all these kind of things. But also you need to keep in learning the things, how to be a street smart. And a lot of things actually I have to say, once the company grow bigger, you need to go beyond on a lot of a, uh, technology product on the, on, on the side. <laughs> and also need to be, make sure to how to deal with people, right? how to deal with all the marketing sales operations. So that's the part I actually need to be constantly learning. So that, that, that's, a really good, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, my, my experience with great entrepreneurs is they see a problem and they feel compelled to have to solve it and they will, they will the company into existence. I mean, it's very, everything is kind of against a company getting started when it first gets started. Uh, but it's the force of will of somebody believing in it and not giving up that, that really gets the company started. And I have enormous respect for Ken because every time you've started something, you've just kind of dove in and, and solved the problems along the way. So, Maybe you can talk for a minute about what the difference of the profile is between a founder and somebody who, and, and the key entrepreneur versus uh, the transition to bringing in kind of professional managers and, and, and building out other parts of the, the, you know, the rest of the organization and, and talk a little bit about you know, how it's different and uh, uh, how you've transitioned and how you've learned in, in, your, in your role from initially being founder to to now being CEO of a publicly traded company? I think we're, I feel pretty lucky the space I play, internet or whatever, is a very dynamic, changing very quick. You need to, whoever can learn quick, faster, whatever, has more chance to be successful. But on the other side, once the business grows in a certain stage, you also need to make sure uh, not only cover whatever on the technology side, and, uh, and also a lot of other, other area. Uh, which also need to have a, a whole team. That's where, like, from, it's kind of, for me, it's interesting. All the three companies I started is all in the same space. And then each one I try to learn from the mistake uh, I made in before and then try to improve it. And also try to play our advantage. Because uh, if you look at our, our space, whether the internet, a lot of company is really doing work quick on the software side. So we're very unique. We put a lot of security internet function into the chip. So, so far, I have not seen pretty much no, no major company doing that. That's what gave us more advantage and, uh, and uh, kind of a, <clears throat> a difference than others. Eventually, I feel that's have a more chance to, to be successful. But on the other side, I, I agree with you, it's really, that's why I kind of, a, I feel the education is kind of important and also team player also kind of important because uh, I have to say different team come from different background, right? team, team member different background. That each one has uh, their own kind of strengths. So that's where in the beginning has to be more open and, uh, and also say, hey, when's the company grow in certain stage, uh, where we, is our limitation and where's our strengths, what's the competitor? So there has to be more open and uh, deal with the issue the, the earlier the better. So that's I feel kind of a, and also one thing I, I feel a lot of Asian Americans is kind of, they, they, they tend to be hiding the issue. Let's, let, maybe let's wait, let's see, and maybe since maybe get better or whatever instead of uh, have to face it to deal with it. Uh, my experience really, when, even you, when you start a company, you can keep open communication in the very beginning, and then in each stage, you just say, hey, in order to reach the next stage, what's, what's, what's we need to do? What's all the limitations? So the earlier you can communicate this one, the better future you can deal with it. So that's quite important. So deal with all, also different culture background, different team members is, is, a, is, a, is a open communication view is, a, is very, very key. And how has your management style changed as the company has grown? Um, I think once the company get bigger, um, probably will be spend more effort to deal with people. Uh, so instead of, uh, so that, that, that's the part you have to, but also you also need to see, sometimes you need to see the people, sometimes they're better, stronger than you, especially in a lot of area, to recognize that one and keep it very open, that's kind of important. And, uh, and also try to see what's your own strengths. I have to say, I, I agree with you. Sometimes we are working good on, because I'm in this space for so long, I, I probably can see some technology seems better. But on the other side, 
a lot of other area I have to keep in learning from, from marketing, sales, finance, or the operation. So that's why there are some people is very good being in this area, being trained has not a culture and not have the relation. So that's where keep it very open and uh, have them been the same as a partner okay. is very important. Let's, uh, let's shift for a minute and talk about this so-called bamboo ceiling, and let's bring up the second question. So Ascend recently published a statistic that while Asian Americans comprise 23% of the Bay Area and over 50% of the Silicon Valley, broadly speaking, workforce, they only uh, represent 12% of the executives and 8% of the board members. And so the question is, do you believe a bamboo ceiling is in Silicon Valley? And uh, uh, please vote. Uh, and then I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask y you guys why you think uh, the statistics are what they are, and whether you think there is a bamboo ceiling. Yeah, the, I, I agree. In in in, uh, in the corporate world, especially when you go to the bigger company, uh, they are, they do have the bamboo ceiling, right? So that's where. Uh, so 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 talk a little bit more about that, and why do you? Uh, how do, how do you explain those statistics and, and what do you think can be done about it? And then I'll ask Gideon to say, talk about the same thing. Um, I think first we need to recognize, uh, so it's really, it's very, very good study. So that's where we, we kind of make it very, very open, very visible, and then we need to see how we want to deal with it. Uh, so that's where uh, sometimes I say, for each American ourselves also, especially for the first generation, we also need to keep, in, keep in improving learning ourselves because I have to say, sometimes when you go to relatively higher level in the, in the management or some bigger com company corporation, a uh, lot of things study more relate to all the sales, marketing, and some other area, which I have to say, Asian Americans still a uh, little bit behind on the percentage of uh, in that level. Uh, so that's probably the some- yeah, that's that's a little bit disadvantage. But it's on the other side, uh, we are very strong market on a lot of technology engineer side, and uh, that that's the part. Uh, how to like uh, recognize the difference? How to keep it improving, and also how to leverage the global, because nowadays the the corporate is not no longer just focusing local or this kind of things, especially internet related. You really need to go global. So that's what we try to recognize. What's the the advantage, uh, sometimes like for us, English is my second language, but I, if, if I can uh, deal with some other things really, uh, business like in Asia or whatever, I, I may have an advantage. So that's the part need to be recognized. Uh, what's, what's your limitation, what's that advantage, and then try to improve yourself, and at the same time, uh, have the partner to work in closely together and uh, try to deal with situation. Uh, so I feel that that's kind of important. And, and what do you think, uh, is there anything that, that can be done to increase that representation? You know, could, could our community or C100 do something to, to, help, to help improve those statistics? I think we need to make the issue more visible. And also, even for the bigger company, uh, if they, they kind of uh, uh, don't recognize the, the advantage the Asian American has, and also try to get a global business of this culture, they probably also were starting kind of losing that uh, competitive advantage globally and with some other companies. So I think it's a, that's a very good study. So that's what we feel is this is the one. And at the same time, uh, I think it's a need to be more communication, more like a, uh, <clears throat> kind of a, this kind of conference and uh, talk about it. And uh, that, that's eventually, and also uh, <clears throat> uh, eventually I feel, because I think it's a, the, the whole economy in Asia is, is a boom, it's growing yeah, probably faster than other, other regions. So that's what we eventually will be very, very important if the company will be global. So that's why we have some advantage in that area. Uh, so we really need to have the bigger company recognize our advantage. Right? Right. So that's, that's the part I feel uh, we, we can do it. After 100 years, we're relevant again. <laughs> um, Gideon, do you have a point of view on it? Yeah, all that stuff was very well said. I, 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 look, the, the numbers don't lie. Obviously, I mean, the, the, it certainly does not uh, look good uh, as far as a representation. But uh, you know, my, my take on that, given given that you know, just like Ken, I've done a lot of hiring in Silicon Valley. Uh, if a bamboo ceiling implies some sort of systemic anti-Asian uh, undercurrent, uh, I, I don't think that exists. Um, 
uh, let me give you a, one, one quick story. When um, you know there was a similar uh, thing to this uh, in the Korean community, where uh, a couple of the chairmen of some very big corporations in Korea came over and were asking uh, various folks your questions, and, and somebody, one of one of the chairmen, um, said, "Hey, wh what can we do in Korea to get more like Silicon Valley?" And uh, you know, everybody went around the room and said, you know, do this, do that, uh, you know, embrace failure, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I, I took a little bit more of a controversial view on that, which was, um, look, you know, in, until uh, the parents and the, uh, and the older generation either become less relevant to the discussion or change their views, uh, they're going to continue to raise us in a way, uh, or the next generation in a way, um, where, uh, brands matter, where bigger is better, where older is smarter, um, and failure is shame. Uh, these, these are four things that are absolutely antithetical to Silicon Valley. So, you know, in, in, uh, in the NFL, it's funny, we, we think about uh, where do we market to, to, to make sure that uh, in the future we have fantastic product, meaning a great football team on the field. Um, and what's interesting is the consensus answer is, the, is, is to market to the, uh, to the mothers of the young kids considering whether they play football or soccer or baseball. And it's to say, hey, football is safe. You should continue to put the, your, your best kids uh, in, into, uh, uh, into the sport and to market that way. And I think it's something similar here. You know, I, look, I, I, I totally understand the benefits of having underrepresented people or, or, or groups uh, get jobs. I, I, I totally understand the benefits of that. Debating affirmative action is certainly out of the scope of this, uh, of this panel, but what I would say though is um, uh, a similar approach to going to the, uh, to the mothers is going to uh, uh, the generation that actually says something, that actually uh, you know, currently controls things or, or, or um, <laughs> Uh, or says things publicly. I think that when you ask what, the, what, what, what this committee can do, you know, look, we, we should look at ourselves. Uh, we should talk to the people uh, that, uh, that make the statements and set the policy uh, um, and make sure that they fundamentally, deep down, uh, embrace these values. Because if they don't, it doesn't matter because 10, 15 years from now, when, th when these people that uh, are being raised in that value culture will grow up into the uh, uh, executive age, they won't have uh, the mentality to do it, in my, in my opinion, regardless of whether um, they're qualified. There'll be some that'll, that'll bump through the ceiling, but I think that, in my opinion, you know, it, is largely the issue. It is, it is 15, 20 years ago that's manifesting now. Okay, so, so what I heard you say, uh, what I heard Ken say is rare, raise awareness. What I, what I heard you say is kind of address some of the cultural differences that make it, make it okay, you know, uh, in some sense awareness. Um, an interesting question would be, do you think, uh, I didn't hear either of you say, you know, the concept of affirmative action, uh, really, in, 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 into the true sense. So I guess some of the question is, do you think uh, affirmative action can work in entrepreneurial companies? Um, probably, some small chance, but I have to say, uh, sometimes when you're working on the, the entrepreneurship of the company, you have to be uh, more flexible and also try to like uh, play. It's a, it's a very dynamic area, I have to say. Uh, if there's a certain pattern, a certain form, or like try to learn from the business school, or something, that's probably will be difficult to apply. Uh, just like, uh, when you play some sports, whatever, you need to be agile, you need to be kind of adapted to what's the, the whole environment and, uh, and uh, try to, try to uh, like, uh, in all different angles. I think that's, I, I really like the article, uh, Angie, and you, you forward. I think that that's the way I feel will be better way to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally think that it's really hard for it to work in entrepreneurial companies because there is no margin for error in every hire. Uh, you know, when you're only five or six or seven people, it represents, you know, 15 
15% of the workforce and you can't really afford to compromise because good people are so hard to find. In a larger company where every individual may not really make that much of a difference, it might be, it might be uh, a, a nice thing to do from a utopian sense, but I think there, it's, it's too mercenary to do in an entrepreneurial company. Um, but I think the awareness part and looking at least to try to do that is, is, is possible. I, I don't know if you agree or disagree at all. Yeah. So let's just talk uh, a little bit about kind of role models just for a second. So you, you talked to Gideon about this notion of, um, in some respects, you know, uh, the, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, kind of an Asian culture, um, potentially his, uh, hindering leadership by encouraging deference or risk aversion or, um, or underdeveloping leadership skills, that kind of thing. Do you think that the, the, the rise, in particular, the entrepreneurial activity in China uh, uh, changes your view on this? I mean, we're about to, later this year, as, as most people expect, you know, Alibaba to come out with an IPO with a market cap, a trading value of 150 to $200 billion, probably the largest, you know, tech IPO uh, eclipsing, eclipsing Facebook uh, uh, in history. And, and you were very involved with the Alibaba team, I know at Yahoo, uh, kind of negotiating that, that initial investment. I mean, but that's just one. You know, some of the, the most valuable internet companies in the world are now based, are now based in China, um, whether it's Tencent or Baidu. Do you, do you think that the, the rise in entrepreneurial activity in China kind of reshapes uh, the thinking of others, or does it, does it reshape your view uh, in terms of role model? Yeah, so uh, not knowing how it is on the ground, mm -hmm. um, only knowing what I read uh, and what I hear anecdotally, um, I'd say it depends. And what it depends on, in my opinion, Jeff, is, is um, are the entrepreneurs out there seen as countercultural? Are they kind of seen as the rebels? Uh, or is that more kind of the new, the quote unquote, new normal? Right? So, so if, if it suddenly has become okay um, uh, to the people that matter in your life, parents, lawmakers, you know, managers, that, uh, that hey, it, it actually is a valid career path to go out there and start companies, then yeah, that fundamentally will change it. And I think that, you know, looking at stories like a Jack Ma, like, uh, you know, like Robin, you know, from, from Baidu, you know, these kind of guys that are so inspirational, if that causes a, a fundamental shift in the way in which uh, that generation sees entrepreneurship, then yes, I think that that's gonna be great. And, but it will take examples like that to, to slowly chip away at this over time. I'm not sure when it happens, but I think it will happen ultimately. Can you have a point of view on that? Yeah, I think that's where, like, compared to like 20 some years ago, when we come here, that time, uh, if you want to start a business, pretty much more focused in the US market. Now, it's really the global, the whole thing's changing a lot. And uh, that's where uh, how to, that's where a lot of, uh, even whether in, in my company or, or some other company we're working with, sometimes try to make sure they, they, they understand uh, the word compete globally is kind of important. It, it's no longer the old, uh, the way it's really, hey, it's US the center, all this kind of thing, but now it's really a lot of things, like especially internet connections globally. So recognize that one and also keep it engaged, keep it compete. That's, that's the better way instead of just try to hide it in, in, in some small, uh, uh, like closed uh, world. It's a, it's a, eventually may, may lose the whole, whole, whole global leadership for the US. That, that, that's how I feel. Uh, so we need to constantly kind of uh, 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 like bring this to, to all this business community at the same time. Uh, that's where Asian American view has a huge advantage uh, in this changing world. So that's where uh, we kind of more understand the both a little bit, right? So how how to leverage our our core advantage, uh, whether the culture, the language, and the technology, and the, all, all these kind of a, it's quite a valuable asset for us. Uh, that, that's probably need to play to our advantage uh, instead of just a. <clears throat> that's why when I see some bigger company, they kind of well. Maybe we just want to be more protective. And eventually, from history, I don't see any company that are too protective, too close door. Eventually, they will be winning the whole things globally. So they have to be more open to recognize and then try to try to engage. Uh, so, so that's I feel is a quite quite important. 
You know, I, I, I will tell you that the, you know we we have uh, we have an office in in um, two offices in China, and so I go over there a, uh, on a pretty regular basis, and I've seen a huge shift in um, the quality and the aggressiveness of the entrepreneurs on the ground in China, and we always joke around that that uh, you know it's kind of um, it, it's unbelievable that these companies are trying to kill each other. Uh, they'll work themselves to death to make something happen. And, and I've had an opportunity to meet some of this, the CEOs and the management teams of the, of the, larger, uh, the larger Chinese companies, and they are more aggressive, I think, than, than even any of the US companies, um, maybe with the exception of Google. But um, they, they, are, they are as aggressive and as determined to succeed and as relentless as anybody I've ever seen. And it, it'd be really hard to bet against them, particularly given uh, and I think they're not just um, thinking that they want to dominate the, uh, the domestic China market. I think they want to, you know, they're looking at dominating, you know, global markets. And, and so, my, you know, my hope is that, that and, and that's very antithetical to this notion of uh, deference and um, uh, submissiveness. Uh, so I, I do think that this next generation of, of leaders will, will, will reshape, you know, at least some cultural opinions as it relates to business. Um, talk for a second, you know, before we go to questions, um, you, you know, think back a little bit. And as you've gotten older, I'm sure your, your, uh, your views and philosophies towards your own cultural identities have, have changed and your goals. Talk a little bit about what advice or guidance or encouragement you'd give to your fellow aspiring Asian American executives about their efforts and identities and values. Um, yeah, I have three kids. I have to say uh, their age of uh, 9, 14, 16. Uh, it, it's quite a different environment, but when we grow up, it's kind of a, uh, uh, there are probably a few, um, I will not use this word lazy. It's kind of a, they're too relaxed. <laughs> in, in some way, probably better for them. And, uh, but on the other side, sometimes when you get competitive in early age, eventually, if you can shape you better, it'll be tougher uh, to deal with some situation. And uh, on the, I have to say, the, a lot of uh, first generation, even the second generation, as you say, uh, because the toughness, because the, the way we, we bring up actually make us kind of working more extra hard and also sometimes put more effort to get things done. So I feel that's kind of very important uh, as an important culture, we, if we can keep up this one. And also from us, really, because it's, uh, like I said, keeping repeating, it's a, it, it's a global uh, world right now. It, it's a, uh, also make them understand the, the culture in Asia and also in the young age and then eventually will be more their advantage. Uh, so instead of, uh, I know my kids also, they, they don't like to want to learn the Chinese, all, all this weekend class, whatever. Uh, but I say, hey, maybe when they're still young, maybe you can add some pressure, but I feel eventually that, that's better for them and also uh, uh, keeping, keeping some, some, some kind of, uh, uh, the background we have, help them understand eventually I feel uh, would be quite uh, useful for them. Uh, so the best advice I ever got was, um, was very simple but pretty profound. It was uh, uh, follow your guts and be excellent at something. And it, you know, and it almost didn't even matter what it was when, when, the, when, uh, when, I, when it was told to me. And, and I'll tell you that it's easy to hear that and you know, write it on your wall and, and, and look at it. But, to actually turn that into um, actionable advice, uh, it, again, you know, it, it goes antithetical to a lot of the things that uh, uh, that we learned as we were growing up, right? Um, uh, if if your gut and your passion is telling you to go for uh, working at YouTube, which is what which is what my gut was telling me, you know, I didn't have the courage to do that until you know my uh, my what mid thirties, um, and what was interesting is that that. Uh, that combines so many uh, things that I was passionate about um, uh, together in one job that uh, it really allowed me to be to to to, to outperform pretty pretty well. And 
And, and I, so, so I think that it's, it, it really comes down to being just good enough at uh, pre-law or pre-med or whatever else like that is not uh, as, as valuable to people up here when we're hiring people. Um, it's not as valuable as you being fantastically excellent in something uh, and being, you know, uh, uh, being one of the best in that, again, re regardless of what it is. That's great. Uh, and, I, and I guess if I had asked myself the same thing, I, I would say that um, uh, over the years, I've kind of been surprised at uh, how uh, hard work and, and stepping up and, and, and leading, uh, how much people um, respect that and how much of, of a vacuum there really is and, and how few people are really willing to do the hard work and to uh, step up and take an opinion. And that, that if you feel very strongly about something, doing it and, and you know, uh, you may be viewed as a trailblazer or a role model, but it, it's really kind of doing what you think is right. And uh, I'm, I've been always surprised at uh, how, far, how far that kind of stuff gets you, you know, surprisingly. Um, Gideon, I want to before we uh, before we go to the questions, just one last thing. So, um, you know, when Vivek was here uh, the other day, he's the new owner of the Sacramento Kings. You know, your your uh, co-owner of the the Forty Niners. I'm trying to think. Are are there are you the only two uh, Asian uh, American owners of uh, major U.S. you know uh, American uh, sports franchises and 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 like. You know, why did you get involved with the 49ers? I mean, I've always yeah, wanted to know. Yeah, um, with the 49ers. The, the, uh, the flip answer is, is actually kind of somewhat right. It, it was, it, it, it's what amounted to almost a midlife crisis uh, for, for me, uh, in the sense that, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, one of the pieces of advice that I got a long time ago that was also good was, don't, don't be afraid to just, Control, control all delete. delete. You know, don't, don't, don't be afraid just to reboot and reset uh, where you are in life and just go after something completely new and fun. And, uh, and for me, uh, you know, the, the, the five-year-old boy still inside of me um, uh, has always had a passion for, uh, for sports and especially football. And uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to meet uh, the York family, uh, who, is, who are the uh, primary owners of the 49ers. Um, and, you know, I, I got the opportunity then, Jeff, to um, uh, take my, uh, my, my hobby, uh, which was football and my profession, and just kind of swap them. And um, uh, let, me, let me tell you, um, whatever your football is, whatever, whatever it is that, uh, uh, that you'll ultimately have an, an epiphany in your 30s or 40s or 50s to, uh, to go and chase your dream, you know, let me tell you, it, 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 was, it was so fulfilling. Um, you know, that, that on a daily basis I'll get down on my hands and knees and, and thank God for the job. And uh, uh, if you can get to that point, it's, it, it's incredible. And, th and that's really why I went there. It was just an overwhelming passion for the, uh, for the product, for, uh, for the company, as, as well as, you know, that's my favorite football team. Well, I, I gotta say, in, um, uh, you, you've had a remarkable success in everything you've done. Uh, I, I, th I think this is accurate. You were there, you were at the 49ers for three years. And in those three years, you got a new coach. You made the playoffs for the first time in I don't know how long. Uh, you uh, went to uh, a Super Bowl uh, and, and uh, a championship game. Is that right? So, I mean, that, that, that's a pretty good, oh, you built, and you built a stadium, and you got a Super Bowl. So, um, <laughs> what have you all done today? <laughs> um, so, now I'm gonna go to questions right now, but maybe you can put up the last question. We'll skip the second to last one, put up the last question. And uh, I'm just curious for the audience, if you had to, <laughs> which would you rather own? Would you rather own the Niners, the Warriors uh, that are in the playoffs uh, tomorrow against the people who are standing in the lobby, uh, the Kings, uh, the Giants, or the ragtag group of other, uh, excuse me if there are people from the East Bay here uh, or Wait, who so really you, like so, hockey. So are you saying that you can have all of you the can ones have on that number five? Oh, all right. I'll trade. Every, I'll take all, all of them. <laughs> door, door number five is the A's, the Raiders, and the Sharks. Wow. 
So I'm just curious what uh, the, 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 the audience here would have. And in the, and in the interim, I'm gonna, th there's a question for you, Gideon, to start. It says, uh, did any of your teachers in grade school or high school help you, or did they a or actually make it worse? <laughs> and I don't mean academically. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great question. Um, uh, well, there, there's, there's many on both sides of that, uh, of that question. L l let me tell the story of the, of the one that helped me the most. Um, uh, my, my father had just enrolled me uh, uh, at, at the quote unquote good school, and, and in Nashville there's not many good schools, so if you're from there you know which one I'm talking about. Um, and I, I, was, I, was, I was not doing very well. Um, it was super hard, a lot harder than my, than, than my uh, previous schools were. Um, and so he had me uh, apply for the math contest that was coming up. And we're uh, Niners. Wow. <laughs> Niners, cool. grab bag, uh, Giants, Warriors, and Kings. Not a lot of people from Sacramento here. But just economically, you, there's just more value in three teams versus one team. But anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're voting. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're talking like a CFO. Not, uh, exactly. You vote with your heart. Um, uh, and so, so, so I, go, I go to this, um, uh, and I'm like, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, um, I'm, I'm not doing well. I'm in the regular Algebra one class uh, because my previous school uh, didn't have uh, pre-algebra. And um, so I go and apply, uh, uh, write down my name for the sign-up sheet, and um, this, this, this little old lady from behind the, uh, uh, this, this, this desk says, hey, you know, what, what are you doing? Who are you? And so I said, well, I, you know, I'm Gideon, I'm, I'm uh, applying for um, the algebra math contest. And, uh, and, and here's what she says. She says, well, I don't know you. Um, I teach algebra one. I said, no, no, you teach the advanced algebra one. I'm in the regular algebra one class. <laughs> and um, she says, well, why are you doing this? And I said, well, because my dad told me to. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, tell you what. Um, if you actually, and, and this, you know, I, to, to this day, I, I recently was, was uh, uh, opened up a scholarship fund in her name at, at, at my high school because here's what she told me. She said, um, tell you what, uh, if you actually want to apply for this, um, for this um, you have to promise me that you'll spend an hour with me after school learning uh, additional math topics uh, to prepare you for this. Um, and that was over the next uh, two weeks. Um, we did that together uh, three or four times a week for the next four years. Um, and I think what, uh, what she did for me, uh, one, is immeasurable, only second to my parents. Um, but what she did was for me what wasn't to, to teach me math. It was um, her overwhelming enthusiasm for mathematics uh, uh, infected me. And you know, to, to this day, you know, I will still on planes uh, to, to, to pass the time instead of watching movies. I'll do math contests. And uh, oh yeah, that's awesome, dude. That's weird. that's awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the uh, that's the story. And uh, you know, if, if, she, if she's out there watching, you know, I uh, you know, to this day, you know, love her to death. That's great. Okay, the second question, which I'll, I'll pass to you, Ken, is given the struggles and achievements in your life, which values and identity? Do you think you uh, embrace more uh, as you pass lessons on to your children? Um, I think for me, kind of a cross the culture, both on the Asian and also in here. My, my, my whole life is half in, in, in China, half in here. I, I view that's kind of a more valuable uh, gift, actually. It's more advantage, and uh, <clears throat> that's probably a few. Uh, for the kids, for some other things, really. Uh, sometimes they need to spend extra effort, like learn the Chinese language, all these kinds of things. But eventually, that's that will be a huge advantage. And uh, that, that's, that's probably the things we really need to make sh make uh, uh, the kids or some other aware of this. And uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, lucky we live in the Silicon Valley, I have to say, <laughs> especially in the, in the high-tech area, in, it's a multi-culture, uh, may not have a, some struggle or it has in the early days. Uh, but on the other side, uh, I feel the next generation of some other newcomer here uh, is also 
Nidu kind of a uh, land post. Uh, I think that one thing I think I have to say in the last 20 some years, I need to keep in catch up even learning is how the American culture, how this kind of thing, because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, we want to be here, uh, uh, and that's you need to be keeping learning this. Uh, so that's this are quite important. And instead of, uh, I see some of my, my, my other friends tell me sometimes, hey, it's too difficult here, and then they may just go back to China. Could be they could be more successful, like uh, Robin, some other people might buy too. But I feel, for us, I feel this is also a lot of uh, opportunity, a lot of learning curve we need to learn, and then eventually also could be more successful this way. Uh, so that's where I, I kind of feel pretty proud about the, the Asia market identity because look at maybe 10, 20 years later, it, it's a probably we're in much better position from across the culture, across other, it, it's the, the global is all changing around right now. Uh, so that's where I recognize the, the change in the long term also prepared, uh, whether ourselves or the next generation, I feel uh, it, it's kind of important. That's good. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought, just as an aside, I thought that was a really interesting question. It really made me thought, think about, uh, as I looked at my parents, one of the things I found that they really instilled on me, it, it, in, in me, I guess, is a level of pride. You know, I think, I think certainly uh, uh, the Chinese are an incredibly proud people. Uh, and I think it's hard to underestimate how much uh, pride can drive somebody into doing things uh, and uh, uh, achieve a certain level of success that, that people who have no pride uh, uh, do and uh, cannot do. And, and I think um, trying to live up to your parents' expectations of pride is, uh, I found, was a very motivating, um, a very motivating uh, emotion. So, Gideon, this is a hard question, so I'll give it to you. Um, in today's high-level business world, women don't have a lot of C-suite presence. Do you have advice for young women today in terms of career and business advancement? And do you agree with Sheryl Sandberg's view in her book, Lean In? <coughs> Um, I, I, yeah, look, I, I think that uh, there, there are very, there are several um, uh, former colleagues and friends who are women that, uh, uh, that, that, that I mentor a lot, very actively. And what I tell them is, um, the advice is very similar to what I try to tell uh, uh, other, other people who are of Asian descent and, and, and have been so influenced by the culture that we grew up in, which is, um, largely what Cheryl says. I, I'd say that you know, it, it is uh, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, don't be afraid or, or, or angry when, when, when you do speak up that people say, well, she's just trying to be more manly or she's got uh, whatever other issues she's trying to put on, on an air or whatever else like that. That's totally okay. Uh, the, the number of times that uh, similar things were said about me um, uh, were, were also very numerous. I don't pretend to say that, uh, that I share the same issues that women do, but, but what I'll tell you is that uh, one of the things that, that, that I had to do with, with, with coping was to take every single one of the problems that you have, whether they be racial problems, whether they be pimples, whether they be whatever it is when you're growing up, put them all, you know, in, you know get, get them all in line, get them all um, uh, you know, at the same level. Don't be more or less offended by any single one of them. Uh, use that as a big shiny chip on your shoulder and go and, and, and move forward. And I'll tell you that it's okay, uh, it's, it's totally okay for you to be smart, uh, and you should be smart, and you should show how smart you are, you should show how aggressive you can be. Uh, not for appearances or because you think you have to, but be as good as you are. And, and I'll tell you that uh, when I've found um, women who do that, more often than not, which is a tragedy, more often than not, they have to shed some sort of learning or some sort of other scar tissue that they've accumulated over the years. And that's really terrible. So hopefully that will be fixed over time, whether it's Cheryl's uh, efforts or whatever what other efforts. But, but as it relates to right this very second, um, and I'm very passionate about this, as it relates to this very second, uh, you have to do the best you can to unlearn all those things in, in a way that, uh, 
doesn't create anger or resentment uh, to the system that you're then trying to go and win inside of. I, 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 I just throw in there, I, I think that's really good advice. I actually work with two uh, uh, female CEOs and uh, I work with them very differently because uh, one is uh, a, uh, an Indian woman who I think by nature um, uh, tries to hold back her aggressiveness and her, uh, she d defers too much. And I'm always encouraging her to really you know, step out and lead and, and be more assertive because I think her ideas are really great. And, and the other woman I work with, I feel almost has, um, she, she almost has, feels like everything she does, she's trying to prove something about being a, a female CEO. And with her, I almost have to tone her down some and just get her to not do things. This isn't about you know, being a woman CEO. This is about being a CEO. And, and I find that uh, I think Gideon's advice is a good one about you know, be genuine, but also do the things that are the right, the right things. And I, I don't think it's, it's the same answer uh, for, for everybody. Um, Ken, maybe you can tackle this as a second to last question. You know, what do you think is the, the secret of encouraging Asian Americans to lead others? Um, I think first we need to recognize there's a, some, some difference and also, uh, also what's your uh, advantage and advantage and, uh, and be very open uh, about all these things and that's probably and then the other part is really, uh, I think once you're more open, you can more easily build some trust uh, because a lot of leadership really, you, you really need to have the people really they can trust you, they can really, uh, like when you play the, 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 the sports, the team sports game, you really need to have every player trust each other, make sure they can, everybody can count on other can deliver. So that's the part that I feel uh, kind of sometimes Asian culture a little bit more close not outspoken, that may need to be uh, changed a little bit. And, uh, and then uh, uh, on the other side, I think a lot of Asians probably, uh, we, we usually working very hard ourselves. Sometimes more come from kind of what they call the, the farmer's culture, race culture, because there's a long history uh, in a lot of Asian, uh, which from like a thousand years ago, people just working very hard on their own kind of farm or these kind of things. But here is really, uh, I see a lot of uh, Western, whatever here, they, they have a little bit different cultural background. People tend to be more aggressive, tend to be more open, uh, recognize the difference, and also, uh, 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 like I said, it's a be open and also very early to, to see the difference, it's kind of important. And uh, uh, that's where uh, I feel, especially when company got bigger and bigger, uh, you have to deal with more kind of things culturally, and uh, I feel uh, starting to get more, more important to, to be open about that. Great. Well, I think we'll end with one last question uh, for Gideon. How are the Niners going to be this year? <laughs> <laughs> Super Bowl champs. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, on that, uh, thank you very much. I'm very honored to be with you. Thank you all. I think we all want to go out and just uh, go learn math and be good at something. And so we're very pumped. And thank you so much for uh, um, give them another round of applause, please, for excellent advice. As we go to our closing session, I want to remind you that you will not be leaving your devices anymore. No more polling. Your vote is done. Please do leave us the devices. 30 of them are missing. They're no good for you if you, if you take them home. So um, to bring up our concluding remarks, we have once again our chairman, Dominic Ng. Uh, thank you all again for being here today. You know, we have you know, finally concluded our conference. And, uh, but before we leave, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Congressman Mike Honda, who is here. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, because I can't think of any other congressman uh, who has spent more time you know, with us at Committee 100. We appreciate your presence. And, uh, and
as I shared with you last night, uh, the, you know, I will be finishing my term you know, tomorrow at noon, so the incoming chair will be Francois, so I'd like to have Francois to please come up and share with you about this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, and thank you for your effort and leadership in leading the C100 for the last three years. And I, I'm honored to receive the leadership mantle from you. Uh, I do have one question for you. Now that you don't have to answer all the 150 emails at night, what are you going to do with your extra time? You're going to do math? <laughs> <laughs> so at this stage here, I'd like, like to thank you. Thank our, our conference co-chair. Uh, she phone check. She phone? Thank you, she phone. Uh, very nice to have you. She has a performance today again. Uh, and uh, where is uh, uh, Jeff? 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 Jeff Young? Where are you? Go you're back there. Okay. Uh, thank you. And then we also have, of course, our regional chair, uh, Jane Xu. Where's Jane? Thank you, it's very bad. Thank you, great job, great conference. Uh, as always, I want to thank our, our staff, our, our, our two, two leader, uh, Angie and Mercy, thank you. Uh, at this staff here, I want to remind you that our next year conference will be in the great city of New York, uh, where the New York Giants might go to, go to, uh, go to the Super Bowl next year. <laughs> well, one of the, one of the, one of the, uh, it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that. But anyway, next year in April, we're going to be in, in New York City. Uh, it will be great. Uh, we will always have a great time in New York City. And, uh, and actually, our, our, one of our co-chairs sitting here, our regional chair sitting here, as she already promised us, we're going to take, take you to the Metropolitan Museum. It's going to be great conference again. So, uh, see you next April.